Good evening, everyone. My name is Alina Mishra, and as chair of the Law Reform Committee, I am delighted to be able to welcome you all on behalf of the committee to the annual lecture, although it's taking a slightly different format this year. We are extremely grateful that the Right Honourable Sir Geoffrey Voss, the Master of the Rolls, has agreed to speak um, despite a very busy diary. And he will be delivering our keynote speech before we open up the panel discussion. Um, I would like to think that his benevolence in doing so is partly accounted for by the fact that he is a uh, former chair of the Bar Council and remains a great supporter of its programme of works and events. And also perhaps um, we're fortunate to be in the beautiful surrounds of Lincoln's Inn, and he is the treasurer this year, which is a most happy coincidence. Did you know that the Master of the Rolls was originally responsible for the safekeeping of charters, patents, and records of important court documents and judgments written on parchment rolls? <laughs> he still retains responsibility for documents of national importance, being chairman of the Advisory Council on Public Records, and Chairman of the Royal Commission on Historical Manuscripts. I do wonder whether, given our topic this evening, artificial intelligence and virtual worlds, the future of law, these are all being digitised as we speak. Sir so Geoffrey Voss is, amongst a great many things, a member of the Law Tech UK panel and chairs the Civil Justice Council as Head of Civil Justice in England and Wales, Member to the Council of which is to make recommendations to government, the Judiciary and the Rules Committee in order to make civil justice fairer, more efficient and accessible. How does one do that in a rapidly evolving landscape when it comes to innovation, modernisation and technical acceleration? It's a topic that certainly fascinates me. I'm also extremely grateful to our highly knowledgeable guest panellists. Dr. Matthew Lady Casey is a barrister at Full Pump Court, and he is regarded as the directories as a star individual in the field of information technology. Matthew is co-editor of Hervey and Levy, The Law of Artificial Intelligence Suite and Maxwell, and he is a trustee of the Society for Computers and Law. And as if that were not enough, Matthew also holds commercial pilots' licenses in both the UK and USA and regularly advises in the aviation sphere. Shobna Ayer is a commercial barrister, arbitrator and mediator, and she sits on the Bar Council's Legal Services Committee and the IT panel. She plays an active role in deciding on key issues affecting the profession and the wider community, particularly in relation to the implementation of IT developments. Uh, also data protection, security and AI. Uh, originally a graduate in biosciences, Shodna has a busy international practice and often fields knotty problems from the rest of us at the Bar Council on the topic of cybersecurity and the like. Jamie Suskind is a barrister at 11 Kings Bench Walk and the author of The Digital Republic. Tony Blair said, Suskind has established himself as one of the foremost thinkers on the transformative impact of the technology revolution. And his book, which I'm confident will be one of many, was described by the New York Times as a wise, wise manifesto for digital democracy. So I can think of no better trio of panellists to join Sir Geoffrey Voss and all of us this evening. Uh, now, before we get on to the interesting stuff which you'll hear from, uh, you'll hear for, I've got to just let you know a couple of things. So first of all, there are no planned fire drills. So if you hear an alarm, please proceed through the exits. Um, it will be for real. Secondly, after the speech and panel discussion, we will allow time for questions and answers from those of you who are here in person, as well as the many of you who have joined us online today. And uh, at the end of the evening, we will be hosting a drinks reception, which I'm told will be um, towards the back of the room in that uh, area just outside. Um, I'm sure you'll, you'll see the glasses being put out later on. And you're very cordially invited to join us. So if I could now hand over to the Master of the Rolls. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Alina, and um, good evening, everybody. Um, my instructions for this evening uh, were that I was to speak about the role of artificial intelligence in the law, the future of law in a virtual world, and the modernization of courts in a changing landscape. I think if I were to even attempt to cover all those topics, we would be here a lot longer than was anticipated. So here goes. 
Uh, when I started at the bar in 1977, technology was a typewriter and a bottle of Tipex and the occasional Telex machine. But we've come a long way. We started with word processors, moved on to fax machines, smelly ones, if you remember, and personal computers onto the internet, into digitization, the blockchain, artificial intelligence towards the metaverse, quantum computing, and the decentralized Web3. That has been quite a journey. In many ways, the latest developments are coming so fast as compared to the earlier ones, uh, that I think they are somewhat harder to get to grips with. But let me start by stating a few guiding principles from a legal and judicial perspective as to the adoption of new technology generally. First, I think we all owe a duty to those we serve, namely the citizens and businesses here in England and Wales, to make constructive use of whatever technology is available, if it helps to provide a better, quicker, and more cost-effective service to clients, if you're a lawyer, and to provide a better, quicker, and more cost-effective dispute resolution process, if you're a judge. And secondly, I think it is an integral part of the adoption of new technologies that we need to do all we can to protect the very same citizens and businesses from their adverse effects. Now that means that where appropriate, we need to promote effective regulation, rulemaking, data protection, the protection of confidential material, and the minimization of cybercrime. All these present risks to the communities we serve to a greater or lesser extent. But the third principle, I believe, is that none of these risk means that we should forsake the new technologies and the benefits they bring just because they offer risk or challenge to the way things always used to be done. If we were to do so, we would not be properly serving either the interests of justice or access to justice, or the interests of the citizens and businesses who have a right to live in a democratic society governed by the rule of law, where the ability to vindicate legal rights quickly and effectively is central to the rule of law. So that's the theory. How then will new technologies affect legal practice? Now, I've been vocal in the past few years about the impact of digital technologies and smart contracts on the issues that judges will have to decide and on the subjects uh, upon which lawyers will be asked to advise in the future. But in the three short months since GPT-4 was released by OpenAI on the 14th of March 2023, Everyone has been sounding off about how generative AI in its current and future iterations will affect legal practice. Uh, the answer is obviously a lot. Goldman Sachs, you will have seen, estimated last week that generative AI could automate 44%, 44% of legal tasks in the US. Now, it's hard to see why it should be different here in the UK. But I have to confess to being somewhat bemused by the seemingly precise figure that they have identified. How can anyone possibly know so exactly? Chat GPT itself, uh, when asked, says that its most valuable uses for lawyers are to assist them with drafting, document review, predicting case outcomes to inform strategy and settlement negotiations. Now, we all know weeks after chat uh, GPT and GPT-4 was released about the risk that generative AI will produce inaccuracies and, frankly, downright false information. 
and that has been epitomized in two recent cases, one in New York, uh, that of Mr. Schwartz, about which I shall talk a little more in a minute, and one in Manchester. But I'm more interested today in considering how AI might be truly useful. So let's first consider predicting case outcomes before we turn to the creation of advice and transactional and court documentation. So current generative AI is capable of accessing a large proportion of the data on the internet. Now that makes it obvious, I would have thought, that any litigation client would want to know if they could, what it thought as to their prospects of success. The putative client would also obviously want to know what their human lawyers thought and what their human lawyers thought of what the AI thought. Since the AI has access to more and different data than the humans, its opinion would at least be worth surely taking into consideration. And it's also perhaps likely that specialist legal AIs such as Spellbook uh, will provide more accurate and reliable predictions than unspecific programs such as chat GPT. Uh, will the use of AI to predict litigation outcomes materially reduce the work needed to be done by lawyers? I doubt it. Uh, similar, if less sophisticated technology has been in use for years. Now, I think the same question in relation to AI created legal advice and legal documentation and needs to be set against a bit of background. I have for some time warned that lawyers have something of a fixation, perhaps an unhealthy one, with analog programs such as MS Word and PDF. They have as yet really generally, and I'm not talking about those present here tonight, of course, uh, been reluctant to utilize machine readable documentation that would have and could have already uh, revolutionized their work. Lawyers seem to be somehow determined that the information that their documents contain should be created from scratch each time, missing out on the potential benefits of a machine-readable format. Now, perhaps there's a, a thought that having transferable data, which allows even the potential of computed solutions uh, would surely never be of immediate relevance in your practice area. Maybe some of the other ones that are less important. But one of the things that chat GPT will have brought into focus is that retaining the natural language approach will not make you immune from all this computing as you once thought. Whilst there's clearly some way to go, it's obvious that data can be drawn from analog text. Uh, moreover, the benefits of machine readable documentation are that you can obtain data from a far wider variety of sources, that data fields offer you solutions at every stage and allow you later to draw comprehensive data driven conclusions from what has been done. The problem with using AI to produce submissions or draft contracts, for example, is not nowadays that it cannot be done in human language. It can. It, it is the accuracy and appropriateness of what is produced. So far as submissions are concerned, I think regulators and the rules committees, including the online procedure uh, rules committee that I shall be chairing, uh, will need to consider whether there should be any rules concerning the use of AI in the synthesis of submissions. But one thing is certain, that is that any lawyer using an AI to help write their submissions will need to check them very carefully because it will be they who are responsible for their accuracy, not the AI. Lawyers may find that the time needed to check the work of an AI is greater in some cases than writing them themselves. I would expect AIs to be more useful in providing legal research and making sure that things are not missed 
in the lawyer's preparatory work. I also think that large language models like ChatGPT with access to huge swathes of the internet are likely to be of less use to lawyers than either first the specialist uh, legal AIs I've already mentioned, or AIs with access to a more limited store of data. For example, an AI with access to the White Book, the National Archives, Case Law Database, Bailey, Westlaw, LexisNexis, but unable to scrape the bulk of the internet, is more likely to create accurate material for lawyers to use. So will the ability of generative AI to create documents and submissions reduce that kind of work for lawyers? In time, it, it may. GPT is certainly not the last iteration, and future iterations, particularly specialist iterations, will be better and more useful, and lawyers will need to use them. It's likely, though, that other jobs for human lawyers will be created, explaining, adapting, and controlling the privacy of what AI produces. So let me come on quickly to the use of AI within the digital justice system. You all knew you wouldn't get away without my talking about that. As many of you know, we're introducing in England and Wales a system that will allow citizens and businesses at its first tier to go online, to be directed to the most appropriate online pre-action portal or dispute resolution forum. It will also hopefully provide users with what the Lord Chancellor calls ELSA, or early legal services and advice. And some of that early legal advice will undoubtedly be provided by AI, drawing on a limited database of quality assured materials. We all know that diagnosing the nature of a legal problem and initial marshalling of facts can be assisted valuably by AI. We've all been faced with AI-driven chatbots that without great sophistication steer you towards the obvious answers and identify where human intervention is needed. These processes will have a role in the digital justice system. I'm just gonna shut the door. Because if it's not putting you off, it's putting me off. I acknowledge also, of course, that some of the early legal services and advice will need to be provided by real lawyers, so that the creation of this first tier of the digital justice system will need to be a partnership between MOJ, HMCTS, private providers, the judiciary, the OPRC, and the legal profession. And the second tier of the funnel will consist of a range of ombuds and pre-action portals, many of which are already driven partly by AI. And each will use available mechanisms to bring about resolution without the need for legal proceedings. And examples include the Whiplash Portal, ACAS, the FOS, the Financial Services Ombudsman, and hopefully an SME portal that is now under active consideration. It's only if resolution is not achieved at the second tier that the case data will be transmitted by API into the third tier, which is the court-based part of the digital justice system now being created by the HMCTS reform program for civil family and tribunal cases. Now, as I see it, AI will be used at every stage of the digital justice system in giving ELSA diagnosing the problems in simple cases, enabling everyone to be fully informed of every stage of the process that is being undertaken, helping people understand and interrogate complex sets of rules and instructions, and also perhaps to take simple decisions at different stages of the resolution process. And as for robo-judging, the controls that will be required are, as I always say, it's nothing new, for the parties to know what decisions are taken by human judges and what by machines, and for there always to be the option of taking a case to appeal to allow it to be scrutinized by a human judge. The limiting feature for machine-based decisions 
is likely to be the requirement that the users have confidence in the system. And there are some decisions like, for example, intensely personal ones uh, relating to the welfare of a child that humans are not likely to accept being decided by machines. But in other kinds of dispute, small ones, but some commercial and compensation issues, parties may come to have confidence in machine making, machine made decisions rather more quickly than you may expect. So what's the future of law in a virtual world? None of what I've described thus far is likely overall to lead to less work for lawyers. Some tasks will change as generative AI and other technologies make legal research and contract preparation easier. But generative AI is really just one more technology. The lives of all our citizens have become more, not less complex, and will continue to become more complex. And greater complexity necessitates more advice and more simple explanations. Uh, moreover, humans in general, and lawyers in particular, will require training to be able to interact effectively with AIs. So let me come back to the old chestnut uh, only a, a few weeks ago of Mr. Stephen Schwartz, the lawyer in New York who got into trouble using chat GPT to prepare his submissions and found out to his cost that one does not always get entirely reliable AI answers to human questions. Mr. Schwartz had asked ChatGPT if the case of Varghese, which apparently supported his submissions and had been produced by ChatGPT, was a real case. And the AI replied in the affirmative. And he then asked for its source, not entirely satisfied. And the AI said, upon double checking, I found that the Varghese case does indeed exist. And when asked if the other cases it had provided were fake, which they were, it said, no, the other cases I provided are real and can be found in reputable legal databases. Now, the thing here is that bits of what ChatGPT had said about Verghese were real. For example, the reference. Uh, what Mr. Schwartz would have learned from all this was that you need to ask AI a different kind of granular question if you want to be able to rely on the answers. So he ought perhaps to have asked uh, whether the case was reported at such and such a reference and whether it positively decided such and such a point and whether the words quoted were used by the judge in that case. Unfortunately for him, he didn't. But lawyers are not going to get away without using AI for the benefit of their clients, whether it's for legal research, predicting outcomes, or undertaking negotiations. Clients will not, as I've said several times before, pay for things that are available free. So lawyers will need to adapt quickly to the world of AI, the metaverse, and the decentralized Web3. But that will perhaps need to be the subject of another lecture. Thank you. Very much, that's very stimulating. Getting to our panel discussion, I'm very grateful um, for that. It's now getting me um, a little bit worried about a decision made earlier this week about the annual uh, law reform um, essay competition, which will be opened quite shortly. Um, I had thought it would be appropriate to exclude entries that were created um, by the use of AI. But perhaps I need to revisit that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand to... But um, it, it, it's very difficult to exclude things um, created by AI, because when you go on Google, you're using AI. So are you allowed to go to Google in order to write your essay in the competition? No, because you're using AI. So it's very difficult to, to do that. Very true. And I may need AI to help me police that or to go down that route. <laughs> um, I'm going to now open the evening up to panel discussion and if I may start with a question to you Jamie 
Um, you've written extensively on the impact of digital technology, big data, and AI on the uh, body politic, democracy, and liberty. So what are the biggest threats to citizens' freedom that you see coming from AI, and how, in high-level terms, might regulation help? Well, thank you for that um, question. Thank you for having me, and thank you for coming, everyone. <clears throat> Perhaps a, a story will help, but it's from 2009. In 2009, Gordon Brown went to America, and he went to America to meet Barack Obama. He did so at a time when his ratings here weren't very good, and Barack Obama's ratings were very high, and he wanted to bask in some of the reflected glory of the new president. The trip didn't get off to a good start, because what happened was that the British delegation turned up with £20,000 worth of uh, carefully curated gifts from the British public to the American people, symbolizing the special relationship and our long history together. And in return, the Obamas presented Mr. and Mrs. Brown with 20 DVDs of classic American films. And the press naturally here had a field day and declared the entire thing a failure. But the sting in the tail came when Gordon and Sarah Brown got back to Downing Street, not having achieved their aim, decided to make the most of a bad situation and put the offending DVD into their DVD player and sat down to watch it. And of course, the DVD refused to play because it was coded only to work in the North American area. What can we learn from that story? A very important lesson about the century that is unfolding before us. It doesn't matter how powerful you are in conventional terms. Gordon Brown was a very powerful man. You can't get a digital technology to do something that it's not otherwise programmed to do. And as more and more of our actions and our interactions and our transactions are mediated through digital technology, we are subject to the rules that are written into those technologies, that are coded into them. Software engineers are becoming social engineers. Code, as someone has put it, is law. Now, if you imagine, or at least it's like law, if you imagine now taking your first drive in a self-driving car, you need to get to the hospital. What might you ordinarily do in that situation? You might go at 72 miles an hour on the motorway, accepting that you might get in trouble if there was a police officer. You might take a shortcut across a neighbor's land, knowing that they wouldn't mind. You might temporarily stop your car in the disabled spot outside the hospital so that the person who needs treatment can get out. But that car, that self-driving car, not operated by you, might refuse to go over the speed limit. It might refuse to go on ground, which its systems told it would be trespassing. It might refuse for however long to go into a disabled spot. And as more and more of these rules surround us, to answer your question, uh, Elida, we might want to start asking some questions about them that our forebears asked about the law, and in particular about the rule of law. Are these rules open? Are they public? Where do they come from? Who gets to make them? Who gets to choose them? Who gets to appeal against them when they make important decisions about our lives? Perhaps it's an algorithm that determines whether you get a job or housing or insurance or a mortgage. As more and more digital systems surround us, the role for lawyers in society is going to change because there is a new and strange form of power in our midst. And that power is eventually going to have to be made subject to the same accountability that all other forms of power have been in the past. And the best people to help do that are lawyers. And if you now think, finally, just imagine the metaverse. In the real world, lawyers or legal scholars say code is law. But in the metaverse, code is physics. Code determines whether you're a squid swimming through the deep, what the laws of gravity are, what the laws of dimension and space time are. Those who write these rules will have extraordinary power, and we cannot treat them as though they were just the manufacturers of more commercial products. So where do the main threats come from, from Alina? They come from a world where we are increasingly trusting important things, like the way that we deliberate on social media platforms, like what we can and can't do, our freedom, like how things of importance are distributed, social justice. We are delegating those things to people who are unaccountable often, who work in systems that, are, that don't have the same levels of legitimacy as traditional democratic institutions. 
and which are untouched in many respects by what we would traditionally conceive as the rule of law. And so my work in thinking is all about, well, how can we engineer, how can this generation, because it is, it is going to fall to us, how can we engineer a new constitutional system, a new legal order, which holds to account this new and strange form of power? Because you won't find it in the textbooks from the last century. Thank you very much, Jamie. Picking up on the theme of regulation, um, Shobhan, I wonder if I might ask you this question. Governments and in the public sphere are not the only touch points at which AI impacts upon citizens. Increasingly, we are all affected by the use of AI in the private sphere, um, such as when our credit worthiness is uh, assessed or when our job applications are sifted. Do you think this needs regulation or do you consider that the existing regu regulatory frameworks we have are sufficient? Well, first of all, thank you, Lena, for inviting me for, uh, for this and being on this esteemed panel, particularly following, off, following on from Sir Jeffrey's quite uh, well-grounded talk on AI as it is presently. Um, what I must say is, firstly, as we know, artificial intelligence is increasingly being used in decision making. And sometimes those decisions are what you might not have even considered, such as how fast do you scroll down your web, uh, web page may, will be decided as to whether you would get that job application or not, um, whether you're using lower caps when you're, when you're making the application form. Uh, which browser you're using, whether you're using a Safari or a Microsoft Explorer instead of a Chrome and Firefox makes decisions on um, whether you actually have got a chance to get that job. And more and more of this, and some of these things you might say, okay, if I, if I know about it, I can change it. But what about the immutable stuff that you cannot change? Something like your Zodiac sign. Would you believe that you don't get into a uh, an application because of your zodiac sign, or maybe because how the retina of your eye moves, or how your art rate is. More and more of these immutable um, factors are being considered and taken into consideration. So you might think, right? So the first question is obviously, how do you know about these systems? And you probably think, well, what do we have on our framework at the moment? We know very well that these are biased and discriminatory in, in certain practices. Um, the data samples that may be collected, of our, there are three sort of subcategories of bias and discrimination that can occur here. First of all, um, as we all know, even particularly in the IP kind of a, arena is like how you actually do your, um, do your statistical um, research into that particular area and collecting the information itself. Are you getting, are you getting the right population of data uh, and information. Secondly, obviously, is about this inferred data, these new groups, Safari users, uh, Zodiac signs, how do you assess them? They wouldn't go into your normal discriminatory practice under the Equality Act of 2010. I don't think they'll ever be considered as a protective characteristic. So you won't be able to consider them in any of those sort of sections. So what else do you do? We look at the Data Protection Act. And of course, we do have um, GDPR with that, uh, with Article 22, but that still has its flaws because in Article 22, obviously, it's, um, it's, it regulates the automated individual decision making, which is subject to uh, decisions based solely on automated processing. So if there's a human intervention anywhere around there in that decision making, there is that possibility that you're out of that. Uh, requirement. There is also the other kind of discretionary facts that you can take out of it. So is based on the data subject's explicit consent. Now you might say, well, well, they didn't give consent, did they? I didn't give consent. Well, did you know maybe you pressed on that uh, button that went and said that you agreed to all their terms and conditions? And we know pretty well that majority of consumers do not touch on uh, and do not read their terms and conditions very well. Maybe us as lawyers, we probably do, but I don't know how many of you actually do read your terms and conditions. Um, as Jamie's quite rightly said, in this kind of digital economy, we are seeing that we are actually being controlled by the major digital companies. And at the end of the day, it's about take it, take it, take it my way or the highway. So there is a big question mark as to whether 
the existing laws can actually work. And of course, there is the other Apart from Article 22, there is obviously Article 13, uh, Article 13 to 15 about the rights to um, inform the data subject about the rights. But it doesn't actually cover everything and you can actually get out of it in certain ways. There are flaws in that. And there is the concept of whether we could bring, and I've read this beautiful paper by Professor Rebecca Williams from the University of Oxford on whether to bring some of the public law concepts into this area. So, for example, what we might consider in um, the rule of gisting in the terrorist stuff, where there you have to provide a genuine and meaningful disclosure for the reasons why a decision was made. That could be brought into it. So now you can see that where we are going in terms of AI itself, particularly with the way that this uh, technologies evolving at the rapid space and the fact that there are different forms of AI is such a broad spectrum and it contains machine learning and um, GTP chat um, and GPT-4, they're generative um, automated um, processing, but it's only one form of AI and it's evolving. So how do we cater for everything like this? And particularly where we're having this race to supremacy on um, artificial intelligence. So of course we have got the um, U U EU AI Act coming into play. I think, that, but that's going to probably take another two years to come into force. It's just gone through Parliament, European Parliament. We've got the proposed um, UK AI Act coming into place. And of course now we've got the good thing about, I would say UK is at least we're going through a, this consultation process in order to try and make things uh, more adjustable to really consider the view. But do we have it? Who would say that we need proper regulation? I would say, yes, we do need regulation. Thank you very much, uh, Shobna. I'm going to take this one step further in my, my question to Matthew, if I may. So, so far, the focus has very much been on AI being used in environments where it has direct impact on citizens or consumer rights, um, where there is a risk for adverse or unfair or discriminatory treatment of either individuals or groups, or perhaps a situation where there's erosion of liberty uh, and an erosion of the democratic process. But outside of these areas, is there a need for specific regulation of AI, or is it just a technology like any other? Uh, firstly, I don't ever read terms and conditions. I don't know. It doesn't disqualify me from answering. Uh, I, I think the answer is it, it all depends. Take a, a nuclear reactor, and let's say uh, we have a, an AI um, AI tool of some sort which monitors the position of the control rods in the reactor core. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's even a thing. I've made it up, but it, it seems it seems like uh, let, let's take a, you know, a really safety critical use case involving nuclear reactors. One would probably want some sort of regulation around it, but one has to ask oneself, what is one regulate? The power station needs to be regulated for sure. Uh, but the question of whether the AI tool used in the power station needs itself to be regulated is, is a rather more subtle one. I think one has to take it in stages. Uh, does the use of the AI give rise to additional risks as opposed to the previous deterministic systems? Uh, does it give rise to risks of a different nature? Um, if so, one then has to ask oneself the question, we're in a regulated industry, the nuclear power industry, does the existing regulation do what is needed to control these novel risks? And if the answer is yes, you don't need more regulation. If the answer is no, uh, then maybe you do. Uh, so it all depends. Uh, and the same sort of points arise in other sort of safety critical type cases. Uh, take the self-driving car. Uh, the, uh, there's a fairly compelling case for regulations of self-driving vehicles, but is it the AI that needs regulating? I mean, the answer is plainly yes in the case of your car, Jamie, because it's, it, it makes ridiculous decisions. But in the general case, I, I'm not sure that there is. So, so I do actually tend to treat AI as a technology like any other, but, but one has to recognise it's a technology with some a fairly interesting twists, or if you like, it gives rise to some fairly interesting challenges. The Most of them are obvious, uh, and we all know them in this room, but it's just worth dwelling on a few. Non-deterministic decision-making. 
Uh, so what does that mean in practice? Uh, and by in practice, I mean in terms of risk management. Uh, it means unlike uh, other technologies one uses, other, other computer technologies one uses, one typically can't do an exhaustive test of, of an AI application. You don't know when you launch a product how it's going to react in all situations, and probably that is intrinsically unknowable. Now, that, now that can be a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, AI often makes heavy use of data. That can be a bit of a challenge because, uh, well, it requires one to think about what that data is, what quality of that data is, uh, what the applicability of that data is. Uh, what sometimes happens with AI models is they amplify and uh, biases, say, in training data. It can be very difficult to understand the behavior of, of AI models. And, and all of those characteristics uh, do make AI ripe for regulation in some use cases. And that, for me, that's the big message in some use cases. I think it's the minority of use cases. There are massively useful industrial and commercial applications of AI, which, which are in use now, daily use now, uh, which, frankly, in my view, don't require any regulation at all. Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, optimizing routes for a logistics business. Monitoring efficiencies and production lines. I mean, th these are quotidian uses of AI. Now, if they go wrong, what happens is that the commercial provider using them uh, isn't running such an efficient operation. So there's a, there's a commercial impact. Uh, and then, as with any other uh, commercial decision-making uh, process, someone has to decide whether it's worth fixing or not. Uh, but frankly, if it doesn't work, so be it. We don't need to regulate that sort of AI application. Uh, other end of the spectrum, the sorts of things uh, that my co-panelists have been talking about and the sorts of things that happen in the justice system. I mean, if you're using AI to decide whether or not someone gets parole, one may think, OK, well, that's uh, probably ripe uh, for regulation. Uh, but, but even then, it's not necessarily the AI itself that needs regulating, but the process uh, of which AI is a part. And it's quite interesting if one looks at the EU AI Act. I mean, an awful lot of its terms are not really about regulating AI as such. What they're about is regulating the processes and the governance uh, around the use of AI. Uh, so uh, questions one asks, I think, uh, outside the spheres that uh, you were talking about earlier, uh, in order to answer the question, do we regulate AI? Well, what sort of regulation do we need? What risks are we trying uh, to deal with? And do we want to regulate AI or do we want to regulate process? Uh, to my mind, the majority of the time, if anything, it's process. Do we want general purpose regulation or do we need sector specific regulation? Do we need use case specific regulation? Most of the time, I suspect the right answer lies uh, either in sector specific or more usually actually in use case specific regulation. Uh, An occasionally obvious but occasionally quite subtle question is whether one is um, wanting to regulate outcomes or processes. Uh, it really does all depend. For, for a great many use cases, what you actually care about is the outcomes. If, if the thing works, uh, if the process delivers the right outcomes, uh, we don't really care how it gets there. Uh, but for some, that's not enough. And again, uh, the justice system is a paradigmatic example of where it's often not enough. Uh, because you want to regulate the process as such, it's not enough that the outcome is right. Uh, the process which led to that outcome has to be seen uh, to be fair. Uh, so that's a very different sort of regulation. Standing back, because I'm drifting off the question, aren't I? Uh, just a technology like any other? Uh, it's a guarded yes. Uh, do we need to regulate it sometimes? Thank you very much. Um I hope you'll indulge me at one further question from me before I make sure we get some questions from the floor and online. We've focused on perhaps harms and risks and downsides a little bit in canvassing regulation, but can I ask everyone on the panel this question? How do you see AI helping you with your work in the future? Now, this is open to all members of our panel, so please, please jump in if you'd like to answer that. In the medium term, here's what I would love, just assuming everything else stays the same. I would like a tool which turns you from being a, uh, uh, well, the lawyer that you are into a much better one. 
And I think the way what I have in mind as a litigator is a system which I can ask natural language questions to as if it was a very brilliant junior lawyer working with me. So um, you've got 30,000 pages of documents, your trials next week. Could you please pull up all of the documents relating to this issue in the case? And could you summarize what they are there in front of you? That would ordinarily be a junior on a brief fee working for three or four days. We're not far off. I can I know three legal tech companies who are working on this right now. I don't know if any, any barristers or solicitors in the room have already used Magnum technology in, in a trial. Very basic, but what that allows you to do is you have a word searchable bundle, which makes an enormous difference in a trial. The judge says to you, Mr. Siskin, could you just remind me what that contract says? And you're, you're Googling the, the case papers as the judge is speaking and bam, it's there on the screen in front of you. But instead of typing it in, I would like to have a system that I could talk to, that I could ask questions to in natural language and that could provide me with information and make me seem uh, much better than the rather pedestrian lawyer that I have. That would be my, that would be my hope. But, but we've already got that. I mean, every trial, every case I ever do, I don't use paper. Um, I, when somebody says something, counsel says something, I, I word search the, the bundle yes. and I get the documents that deal with the point. And that's great. And okay, I could talk to it, but it would disrupt the proceedings. Um, so Jamie, maybe you're not being very imaginative. I mean, I think that we do need, um, I think AI will help all lawyers massively. I mean, first of all, it already does because we use search engines um, and all sorts of tools that use AI already. And, and secondly, we're, we're really only scratching the surface at the moment of legal research. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? We, we search in legal databases by the system that I seem to remember came in with LexisNexis on a little orange screen machine you had to pay an awful lot to go and see. And it was a red computer um, keyboard and you tapped in words with special search terms and connecting words and so on. You still do, you still do. And if you don't, you don't actually get the best outcomes. Whereas actually, Nowadays, we could get fantastic results from the case databases I mentioned in my speech if we used a little bit more sophisticated artificial intelligence to power it. And we will within a very short time, I'm absolutely sure. But I think it's not just case research. It's also, as Jamie rightly identifies, it's, you know, I used to say about my pupils, this is years ago. I used to say it was a good pupil if they could, they had a sense about a set of papers that came in with 20 lever arch files. And they knew somehow, but within or within a fairly quick time scale, they told me the real worry in this case is on page 341 of bundle 18. And there were two sorts of pupils and juniors, I always thought. Ones that got that at some stage, some quick, some slow, and ones that never got it and always directed you to some completely um, other part of the case. And the good lawyer has a bit of a second sense about where the answer is. And AI will really help develop that second sense and probably and we'll still need the second sense because ultimately you're never going to get a human answer from a machine. That doesn't mean you don't want to know what the machine is going to tell you because you'll be much quicker to the human answer when you do. Yes. Um, thank you, Eileen. And I think just following on from um, both Jamie, actually, Jamie, there is something called co counsel. That's coming out. That's similar to that. But apart from that, I just want to mention that um, I think my next next task on the IT panel and the IT panel of the Bar Council, as like all the other committees in the Legal Services Committee, do everything voluntary. And we have a splendid panel. And I got to admit, um, at the moment, it's uh, chaired by Lawrence Acker Casey, but we have um, phenomenal people that have contributed to it. Um, 
as, and particularly when it came to GDPR, we had our past chair was Jacqueline Reed and uh, Clive um, Freeman. But I, I got awesome at the moment, we do have a kind of AI subgroup. And in that we do have um, Ian Mitchell Casey, who's a um, Scottish uh, barrister as well as uh, in England and practicing in England and Wales. And he has informed me of obviously about the CCBE, which is a council of, I think, uh, bars and law societies of Europe statement on the use of AI in the justice system and law enforcement, which was actually published on the 25th of May, which really are making kind of um, quite strong allegations as to when it's when AI should be used and how it should be used, as, as I think Matthew was um, mentioning with regard to the risk assessment um, viewpoint of it, particularly when it comes to the justice system. But on the question itself, I do find that I am using, well, I think we're all, as mentioned in legal research, we're using AI, but we're also using AI, as we mentioned, in predictive coding, in um, e-discovery matters, those sort of stuff. But also I see that we are talking about virtual worlds here. And particularly when I'm coming from practicing in the intellectual property sphere and the art sector, we see a complete new generation of, especially when the clients are in that particular sphere. and and for compliance matters, um, uh, anti-money laundering compliance, anything else, you can actually get now quite decent um, software that actually does it. But obviously, as um, Sir Jeffrey says, you need to have that second intuition to make sure you know what is going on and what isn't going on. And further to that, I think there is the issue of how are we going to see things in the third, uh, in this idea of the metaverse and virtual worlds? And I know very well at the moment, we are now starting, especially in the arts industry, considering things like holograms and the use of holograms. So we don't have to transport the artifact from a different country to where the trial is being held or where international arbitrations are being held. And also for 3D um, attendance by a witness by hologram rather than having it on Zoom. Um, so you can actually test the demeanor of the witness, believe it or not, it has happened. Um, and I think the US courts have actually even tried it as, as practice trials, but we can see that this is a world and I'm not sure Sir Jeffrey, uh, who I know very well uh, deals with all this on the civil justice panel, particularly with the Futures team. It's very open minded to all this, but this is happening. It is something that we would be having to reconsider. And I think one of the things I'd like to just share a quick story, particularly since I've got a pilot on the panel as well, is the fact that it was told to me just uh, a few weeks ago, and maybe Matthew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I was told that um, pilots. The majority of the flights that you attend, 90% of the time, the, it's on autopilot. But when it comes to actually landing, although you could use a, a, auto, autopilot, the pilot says, no, I'm not using autopilot. I'm going to land it myself. And majority of them do. Why? Because it is a major risk factor. They take that into consideration. And secondly, they want to know, they want to nurture and make sure they know how to land and keep that learning experience there. So they actually know when something goes wrong that they can actually take over. So I think there's a couple of things that we can learn as well. We're not scared. When the calculator came out at the start, um, it, you know, it wasn't as though we don't have to learn our times tables. We still have to do it. Uh, just because a car can go faster than you doesn't mean that we stopped in that industrial re revolution. Today, we've got a new digital revolution going on. And I think we have to embrace it, just as my panel is saying. But at the same time, we have to be really cautious about how we go forward. Thank you. It's actually, I think, uh, it's a good analogy. Uh, the automation does erode skills and that will happen with us as lawyers as well when we're relying more and more on AI and the answer to the pilot point is I mean, it depends on the uh, standard operating procedure of the particular airline uh, but you're right that often uh, you get manual landing because the pilots have to get their statutory numbers of landings in but what's quite interesting is when the chips are really down you know fog cloud on the deck pouring with rain thunderstorms guess who's landing the plane the machine is because the machine does it reliably each and every time. And yes, it goes down with a bit of a thumb, but it's reliable. Uh, I mean, in terms of the tools, I think 
Yeah, that is right. <laughs> uh, we're, we're in a we're in the evolutionary phase, aren't we? The the search tools we're already using, um, as has been said more than once, use uh, AI. Uh, of course, we want to uh, move towards a system where we're making higher and higher level queries. Uh, in a disclosure sense, it's fine with the documents that. In a legal research sense, it's fine with all the authorities on and highlight the passages which. Uh, but, but I think we then go to the next phase, don't we? I, I want case analytics. I want someone to tell me um, who's going to win. And, and more, more importantly, I want to be told what are the three points that are going to persuade the judge and how do I best deploy them? Uh, and then ultimately, I, I think um, I probably want to be replaced so I can do more flying. Uh, but that's, that, that is not in, in, in the near term. But can I make a sort of less flippant observation about the use of technology by lawyers, which is actually... And we talk about uh, things like chat GPT and um, complex searching because that's now um, hit the public imagination for obvious reasons. But we as a breed are pretty hopeless. I mean, we're not using the most basic tools that are available to us and have been for quite literally decades. Uh, for example, word macros to automate. Who here types at the start of each pleading? in the High Court of Justice. And really, you're typing that each and every time? Uh, so you know, we've got a long way to go, actually. Yes, I think another thing is uh, the other use of transcription, not in court, obviously, but uh, a, a fact which I've used a lot is uh, transcribing when I'm having conferences with clients, with transcriptions. We don't have to do those notes anymore in terms of just checking up and keeping minutes of the meeting. So there is a lot of AI that's we're being, that we're using. Thank you very much. Now, I'm acutely aware that some of you in the audience this evening, both here and online, may have some questions. So I'd like to invite you to uh, put a hand up if you do have a question. And we've got a roving mic, I think, that will come out to you. Uh, and we'll also take some questions from our online audience in due course. Thank you, Mariam. Good evening, Catherine Backseed, Freelance for the Times. Does the fact that the law is behind technological advancements present a problem or an opportunity for forward-thinking judges like Jeffrey to uh, form the law or push the boundaries? There's definitely an opportunity, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I think we should all be forward thinking and i think that we will all be forward thinking i just think that some people take a little longer to come to it but ultimately you reach the same conclusions um for example uh, when chat gpt came out and we first saw the results of chat gpt everybody said it's going to change the world tomorrow uh, we won't need lawyers anymore um, it can do everything and we learned within weeks that that was not the case. And I, I actually think it is, uh, we're, we're looking at successive opportunities. It's not just one technology, it's a range of technologies that if we're sensible about it, we will use to do our jobs better. And we will, I mean, of course we can, we can fuss about alignment with human morality, about the risk of AI destroying the world. That's miles away from the law. What I'm interested in is the things that AI can do and technology can do and what it will do to change the practice of law. And, and when my colleagues here were talking, I was put in mind of the question of legal education. And I don't think we discussed enough how we're going to train lawyers in a modern world to take advantage of the opportunities that technology presents. Um, because and for my part, I mean, I, I often say this to universities and get a plea in my ear. I say, but you're training lawyers the same as you did when I studied law 50 years ago. I mean, I started studying law in 1973. That was exactly 50 years ago. And I think they're doing the same subjects now. But when I go to universities and, and say this, they say, no, 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 we're not. You don't understand. And then they point to a, a course that is a course, postgraduate course or something that uh, is specifically based on technology. But actually, 
they haven't given the very careful thought that I think needs to be given to what lawyers in who are going to be the masters of the roles of the future are going to need to know and understand to make maximum use for the benefit of clients. You know, we're not doing this, I always say it, and Catherine, you've heard me say it before, we're not doing this for our own benefit. This is not a game. We're trying to present a provide a service to clients. I'm trying to resolve disputes. You're trying to give legal advice. And it's all from an independent source, and it's for their benefit, not ours. So we're trying to make the service better. We're trying to make it more economical, more cost effective, more proportionate, all those things. And I'm not sure enough thought is being given to how you train lawyers to make maximum use of the tools that are available now. And you know, the other thing I'm very concerned about, and uh, Jamie will will know this, is the tools that will be available so that we're not caught napping because we could be. So, I mean, I'm, I'm terribly excited about technology and I actually don't think that these days there are so many laggards. I think they just take a little bit longer to catch up, but it all gains so quickly that they have to catch up. I echo all of that. And to, to, to the extent that issues of this kind come before the judiciary, we need a judiciary like Sir Jeffrey that is equipped to deal with it and i often think when i'm involved in cases involving technology one of the nice things about them is that you get very and my experiences have always been good you you get very good judges who perhaps aren't that familiar with the area but what it requires the advocates to do is to explain the technology in a way that uh, an intelligent lay person doesn't know about who's not a technologist but i think you might have been hinting at something deeper which is that which is well, I mean, what your question made me think is that we do have an advantage in a common law country that when things move really quickly, the law can develop judicially. I think that's problematic. I think it's often a failure of parliament rather than a strength of judges. If we are always asking judges to decide the most contentious social issues of our day, I'm sure everyone in this room can think of examples from the last four or five years where big social and political questions are being left to judges to decide rather than parliaments doing its job, I think it creates a difficulty because some of the big moral questions of our time will be raised by digital technology and parliament should not fear to tread in deciding them. So yes, common law's country is, being a common law country is great because we can react to a certain extent flexibility, flexibly to our judges, developing the, through our judges, developing the law that way. But if we rely too much on it, there's an obvious problem of democratic deficit and it politicizes the judiciary in a way that I think in this country, at least we've been very good at not doing for a long time. Maybe assisted by a virtual lawyer like what Josh Brader was trying to do in America. Just to, when you're in court, the judges are quite far and bound to say, I don't think um, there's no law of this. They don't have to do something. Well, yeah, I mean, judges obviously have a degree of discretion about how they manage their own procedure. And actually, a lot of judicial procedure, procedure is kind of decided by judges who sort of semi-legislate for themselves in terms of civil procedure rules of various kinds. But they are often a lot of them derived from Parliament. And I agree with you, the, the inflexibility of some of them sometimes. Cause I'm sure there are lots of forward thinking judges who would be champing at the bit to try and introduce new, cool ways of doing cases that maybe the rules don't allow them to do. Catherine, thank you so much for that question. Um, Mariam, I think there's a hand up at the back there, and there was also a hand up at the front. Um, gentleman at the front here, I think, was first. And then there's a gentleman right at the back, if you would mind after that. Thank you. Was was the decision to ask the journalist the first question decided by AI? Or not, sorry. <laughs> um, my, my name's Robin Jackson. I spend my life trying to convince barristers that they operate as a multi-million pound business. Um, I'm sure that the private sector will be developing artificial intelligence because that essentially requires um, aspiration, technological innovation, 
um, challenging orthodoxies and money. So that will happen and resources that will help lawyers will be sold to lawyers for their research, maybe telling them whether they're likely to win or not. My concern though is that for the um, for artificial intelligence to be applied properly for the implementation and access to justice, that requires both the judiciary and the state, Ministry of Justice, the Treasury, whatever, to put that same effort into challenging orthodoxies and putting the money in place. And I'm not convinced that we've had much of an example, and I've worked with, with governments before, and IT projects for governments generally are, are a nightmare. Equally, don't try to log into my HMT, HMCTS at the moment if you really want to get on with life. So although the private sector and the individual solicitor and barrister may well benefit from AI, are we going to have the investment that we need, both aspirational and in money, from the government and the judiciary to make it worthwhile? Thank you very much, Robin. Is there anyone on panel who'd like to take that question? Well, I mean, in the sense, I, I, I can't say what the government will do. I, mean, I, I think, though, uh, frankly, it will come. That there's such an opportunity, isn't there, to widen access to justice uh, through uh, use of, of AI tools, possibly even quite simple ones. Uh, and well-designed websites. Um, I think there are lots of people who are aware. Uh, uh, I, I think it will come. Uh, I think the trick is you, you can make government IT projects successful. You've got to be small, focused, do, do one bit at a time, to take an area of law uh, which causes problems for large numbers of people up and down the country in the county courts, and, and try and just even even a basic decision tree style um, self help kit. You do a little bit of that, and, and I think um, over time we could literally transform access to justice for those who haven't got lawyers. And you know, vast amount of work is going on about this. The um, the the digital justice system I described is becoming a reality. But it is not a government website created by um, hundreds of programmers working for the government creating a thing. It's a, it's a kind of architecture that brings public and private and lawyers together. It's what I said in my speech. And the trick here is to make use of what is already being provided brilliantly by ombudsmen, by pre-action portals, by all sorts of mediators, by providers of all kinds, advice providers, um, third sector providers who have online portals, advice now, you may have been to it, it's brilliant. And to make use of all those and create the connections between them so that people can go online and be directed to the right places. And if they go to the wrong place, the wrong place sends them to another place which is the right place and that is well it, it's a really serious thing i was talking yesterday at the ombudsman association and i was talking to the housing ombudsman who runs uh, an organization online that resolves twenty-seven thousand disputes a year and he was moaning that it's only twenty-seven thousand because there are some disputes that come to him where he has to say, because of good statutory reasons, I can't do it. And the answer to that is that when he says, I can't do it because your landlord is not a member of my scheme, he has a process which sends that person to a place where it can be done because there are other ombuds in the housing and property sector. So basically what you want is a system of coherence and integration which uses the new technologies and provides the access to justice that you need and it not only can be done i'm really confident it will be done because it doesn't need the the 50 million or billion whatever you are envisaging best what it needs is to capitalize on what's already there and provide the connections 
and stop people falling through the cracks and making sure that it is recognized when people need legal advice from a real human being, uh, that they are sent to a real human being to get that legal advice. But we all know that in some cases, there are technologically enabled people who would prefer to get a bot to send them to the place they need to go and not waste time talking to a lawyer. And, and you guys probably don't want to talk to these people because they probably wouldn't pay you um, a serious amount of money. So we need a system that identifies difficult cases, sends those to the lawyers, and deals with the ones that are simple and easy and can be resolved quickly. The prize is to is is economic is economic prosperity for the country because dispute costs so much money, and having people upset, psychologically disturbed, not working properly because they're worried about silly, often very small disputes. And the example I always give is when you go to, if you go to work and you've just received a letter, let's assume it's paper, and you've just received a letter from somebody saying you owe me a thousand pounds when you don't, you spend the whole morning, whoever you are, you could, be, you can be anybody worrying about that letter and thinking, what am I going to do about that? That's terrible. I'm really cross and not working and not being economically productive. So the quicker we can get um, mechanized systems that provide solutions as quickly as humanly possible for those small things, uh, the more productive the economy will be, the less upset our community will be, and the better everything will be. I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. It's not going to happen tomorrow. You know, you, you say, well, my HMCTS is, is tough to, to access. But it's right at the beginning. And as Jamie's father is very fond of saying it will only get better. Thank you very much. Um, I think there was a question in the back of the room, Mariam. Uh, we'll take one more from the floor before I move online. Thank you very much. Uh, Raheem Shamji, I'm the CEO of ADR ODR International. So Jeffrey, big fan of your recent speeches on civil justice and bringing more ADR into the uh, the system. I'm also a barrister at uh, Gatehouse Chambers, but often go by the title recovering barrister. Uh, not practicing so regularly. Um, <laughs> I've wanted to talk about several things that have evolved or my comments have evolved in light of some of your panel's comments. I thought I'd start with the first thing of legal education. I think that uh, unfortunately, we have completely missed the boat on a whole generation of trainee barristers coming through not understanding a technology or the alternative means. And a lot of the comments we've had today have been directed about how we practice and how we can use that practice. But what about the opportunities the barristers and young barristers are missing now on picking up work through AI and the virtual world? So I'll give you an example. I've just imagined lots of this We're training barristers and young people. Barristers and young people. On their bar course, they're now doing a mediation course, arbitration, negotiation, and online dispute resolution. This last module is blowing them out of the water because we're talking about tools like Smart Settle. We're looking at uh, tools that are coming up in here that are coming up with exactly what we were talking about. These tools already exist, and I'm working in India. And one of the transformations for working in India with AI is the whole Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is about access to justice. And we don't seem to talk about access to justice that much as an SDG because we in the West and we don't need these tools for developing countries. But if we had a look at the amount of work that's taking place in the developing countries, inverted commas, we would see that actually from an AI perspective, they're moving at lightning speed. And we have been left a little bit behind. And I really urge the Bar Council and your to push this education piece. I think we're really missing this. And I would invite comments from the panel if you disagree or have views on them. But I think if we don't move quickly, we, we run the risk of having a whole profession missing out on these opportunities. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to pick up on that subject of making sure we don't miss the boat? Um, I think we've touched on legal education, but let me just check. Um, right. So I, I'll just say that I think it's more about uh, 
uh, don't act in haste and repent at leisure, because a lot of these things we have to really deal with. And particularly, I know in uh, India, we have more unicorns, especially with tech development, et cetera, in that way. But the way that AI is having to be dealt with in terms of data protection and um, copyright laws, IP laws, et cetera. But I think for education, for our our, our juniors and our pupils and, and uh, law students, I think more, more and more we're going to have to deal with a combination of technology with that, because tomorrow I think we're looking at working in multidisciplinary teams um, and really, uh, and, and as barristers, we're kind of used to it. We're, we're able to work with experts and really understand and try and understand where we, how we work and how these mechanisms actually can uh, resolve a dispute uh, more efficiently and amicable. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. So um, I totally agree that they have to be uh, compulsory, probably going to be compulsory kind of education with regard to the way that certain uh, components are going to be put in. They're probably going to be put in in the sector. So for example, in contract law, we're probably going to have to deal with smart contracts as well. But I, I do believe that it will naturally come into the syllabus, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on now to see if we've got some questions from the audience who are online. Best name one, two, three. No? Okay. okay. Um, so, do you have a few questions online? Um, the first one is How will AI help with social mobility for disabled aspiring barristers? How will it help? It's, it's very difficult. The, the potential uh, to help is, is, is obviously there, isn't it? Because um, precisely the sorts of things that AI can do so nicely. Let's let's say you're um, you're dyslexic. You have, you have you struggle uh, to articulate your your thoughts on paper and write them uh, in nice clean English without spelling mistakes. Well you don't need to go very far into the future, if at all, for tools to help you uh, with that and, and do that work for you. So plainly, uh, there is uh, there is scope for technology to help with disabilities and, and thereby to help with, um, with social mobility for those who have disabilities. Obviously, it, it depends what technology are you talking about, what disability are you talking about. But in principle, uh, technology can only be a good thing. That Thank you very much. Can we uh, take another question? Yeah. So, um, will the difference between the EU approach with the AI Act and the UK approach, um, apparently more laissez faire in tone with the white paper, be problematic in practice? Or do the panel think that the UK will move closer towards the kind of regulation of the EU? Well, I mean, it, it will. It, it is what I think. Uh, the uh, I, I think we've already moved a little bit away from the white paper, haven't we? Uh, and much more towards something a bit EU flavoured. I have to say, I, I hope we'll go for something a little bit more um, sector specific uh, and less generic than the EU approach. But I think we are moving much closer together. Uh, and, and frankly, there's going to be, have to be de facto uh, alignment anyway, because people aren't going to want to put out products in multiple different markets uh, in multiple different ways. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that they're going to be, have to be harmonization between them. But if you look at the uh, UK's white paper, we take the five principles um, of safety, security and robustness, appropriateness, transparency and uh, explainability. The third is fairness. Fourth is accountability and governance, and the fifth was contestability and redress. Um, I mean, that fits in all with the OCDIs, and that's the um, Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development's um, goals as well. So we find that I think there is got to be this harmonization, I think not just between EU and, and UK, but globally. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, do we have any further questions? Yeah, so um, we have a question. Um, so, how can incoming people barristers begin to incorporate and develop 
AI in it and future practice. We the bears can you answer that. <laughs> yeah, what one thing they could do is um respond to, I mean, just today I got a, an email inviting me to uh, attend a seminar uh, and or a course on how to use ChatGPT in my day-to-day -day practice. So I think there'll be more courses that are available. This is one that was specifically tailored to employment lawyers. So I think, you know, we're seeing more and more of that. And I guess uh, with any pupillage experience, much depends on the chambers you're in, your pupil supervisors. So there's a little bit, can be a little bit of a luck of the draw in that sense, but I'm sure there'll be lots of options for pupils to to kind of educate themselves in this field and, and grasp the opportunities with both hands. But let me see what my more my expert panel say about that. Well, I'm I'm not a barrister, but I I agree with that, and I I also think that the the bigger and really more important question is to um, start the discussion about. And, and it's really difficult, by the way, because basic legal training does demand that you know what a contract is. It does demand that you understand constitutional law 101. It does demand that you know about tort. It does demand you know about property law and so on, and financial services law and tax and whatever it would be. And so every time you try and cut off a bit of hard legal training, uh, you need to have a jolly good reason for doing that. But on the other hand, and, and also you need to understand that the people you're training have a great deal of technical know-how, much more than uh, any old person like me could have, because um, I was brought up when we had Tipex and full scan paper and typewriters. So, uh, you know, these uh, young people simply don't, they don't know what fools cap paper and typewriters and tipex is. And so I think you're starting from there and you have to have a very serious discussion with academics and with practicing lawyers and actually with the whole legal community included as to what would create the most useful um, type of legal advisor for the different sectors in which they operate. Because we've always had this entirely harmonized legal training, you only got out of the harmony in your third or fourth year of training when you were allowed to do something as eccentric as family law. Well, you know, that's absurd because the number of people that practice in family law that are trained in the law is vast. It's probably, I don't know, 30, 40%. And yet you don't get to family law until then. Now, so I think you need to completely rethink uh, what you're training lawyers for, what type of lawyers you're training, and what are the essential core materials that you need to understand in any field, whether it's crime, family, or employment, or anything. And that's really difficult. And I don't have the answers, but I'm convinced in my in my, um, in my my mind that the, we don't have the right answer just now and that we're we're actually we're clinging on to the old way because if you don't change it it's fine it's like it always was but we won't be able to do that forever thank you very much um i want to thank everyone who sent in questions beforehand as well sadly we won't have time to go through all of them but just a couple that fascinated me were these if justice is a human virtue, then how can an AI judgment be given legitimacy? Should legal personality be granted to AI? And how do we combat bias in artificial intelligence impacting law? I was actually fascinated by the very many questions people sent in, and I wish we had time to dis discuss all of those. Um, but what I would like to do is uh, say a very sincere thank you to all of our speakers, to Sir Geoffrey Boss, Master of the Rolls, for giving up time this evening and our distinguished panelists who joined him. It's very much appreciated by the Law Reform Committee and the Bar Council. And if those questions and answers have given you some food for thought, please stay on for some drinks, uh, which will be uh, just outside this room. And I hope you'll continue to engage with this committee. And uh, for some of you online or in this room, think about if you're eligible, think about entering our um, Law Reform Essay competition. Maybe you could pick a topic related to today, who knows? Could we all um, express our thanks in a conventional way, or if you have a hologram, by all means, use that. Uh, thank you very much indeed.
Well, technically, you can see the item that you made. Because you're able to speak to the status. 